I would like to start this meeting with a quick update about what's happening in Loopback world as we are seeing it, and then we can do a round table and uh, just everybody says what is what they were working on, what they plan to work this month or discuss anything or bring any topics they would like to discuss while we are all here. So the updates. Uh, let's start with uh, the number of pull requests which we are always watching at. Uh, April was pretty good. We have we have had many more pull requests than the month before and also quite few pull requests created by our great community. So thank you all. And uh, we are all we have already started to plan a, a roadmap for uh, the third quarter. That's from July to September. And uh, in this quarter, we are wrapping up the work on the migration guide for Loopback 3 users. And starting from Q3, starting from Q3, we want to start looking again more toward the future and new features for Loopback for developers. And one of the things which we are hearing often about is the documentation and how it's sometimes difficult to find the information that people are looking for. So documentation is going to be one of our uh, focus areas in the next quarter. We also would like to uh, increase feature parity between Loopback 3 and Loopback 4. For example, in model relations, there is a has many through and also has it belongs to many relation, which is uh, kind of a cornerstone. Many people are asking for it and the uh, community led effort on implementation is progressing slowly. So we would like to help uh, to accelerate it. And then we are also thinking about looking into better integration with SOAP services. So for example, if you want to build a loopback application that's talking to a backend SOAP service, maybe a legacy like service for all days, then we want to make that easier which is also part of the next item, integration with other technologies. And the rest is like the usual things, improving our internal tooling, fixing bugs and enhancing developer experience. And maybe another point worth mentioning is that we would like to switch from CLI, which is contributor license agreement to DCO, which is developer certificates of origin. And basically with CLI, we need to keep a service which is verifying that whoever contributed a pull request has signed the CLI somewhere. While DCO is much more lightweight, it's just a, a one line in a commit message saying signed off by and your name and email. And uh, the CI check is much simpler because it only checks that yes, there is a special footer in your commit message. And we would like we are, we are already using DCO in Lubeck for example shopping repository, and we would like to uh, bring Lubeck next and possibly other repositories to DCO uh, in the next quarter as well. And we are already or we have, we have a request open to discuss this in public. So if you have uh, any ideas or would like to join the discussion, then please take a look at the pull request number five one one seven. You can join the discussion. And pretty much it uh, about the project as a whole. Uh, the next maintainers call will be in four weeks again. I'll post details on GitHub. I hope you will be able to join us. So so in the next part, or oh, are there any questions uh, about the status updates or our Q3 tentative plans or anything else? Uh, Mario, I think you are on mute. Yeah, Mario, you are muted. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I have a question for the um, the Weasel the Weasel file um, where you generate the LB4 apps. Uh, what, what exactly are you, are, are you? For example, we are going to be creating um, the methods directly from the Weasel Weasel file. So or basically, the, the the structure that it needs to call uh, the remote methods. Or what do you mean by the generate the LB4 apps from Weasel files? I wish Raymond was here. I think he is. He has no knowledge about this area, but uh, I think there are, well, I think there are two ways to approach this. One is you want to consume soap, and the other one you want to build a soap server. I think people would use Lubeck for building soap servers, so we want to focus more on making it easier to consume soap. And what typically happens is that you have the whistle file. and uh, like the messages you are sending and the messages you are receiving back. So the idea is, at least I think that the idea is to 
process the WSDL file and generate TypeScript interfaces for you. And maybe even the service interface describing all the remote methods you can invoke via SOAP. And this is based on the idea which we already implemented for consuming open API services. So if you do LB4 open API dash dash client, it will generate all different TypeScript files for you. And I think the idea is to do the same for SOAP using WSDL. Okay. All right. So basically, yeah. Okay. So basically, it 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 is probably is meant uh, for the remote methods, right? That the whistle exposes, and then we can we can actually grab that information, generate the, the remote methods. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And to make it easier to call those methods from loopback. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you are building a controller where you want to orchestrate two soap services and get some data from a database, then getting data from database that's solved using repositories. But now how do you invoke those SOAP or, or how do you make those SOAP requests and process the response in a type safe way? So that's the part we would like to simplify. Yeah. And we yeah. already have loopback connector SOAP, which is dealing with runtime parts. So it knows how to parse whistle, how to build JavaScript functions to invoke uh, those remote methods, but we are missing the type information. Yeah, we currently we do it manually that part, right? Because I I I didn't have an experience with LB3 before. I don't know exactly how it would work, but right now, of course, we are mm -hmm. we are connecting to soap services and the remote methods. We need to inspect manually and, and do it manually. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Got it. More questions. Um. Ah, hey Raymond. It's great that you join us. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, we were discussing the SOAP integration and what's our plan. And basically, Mario was saying that now when they are uh, accessing the SOAP client and they have Whistle, they have to manually write their TypeScript definitions. If I understood it correctly, Mario? Correct, exactly. Uh, so and he was asking what are our plans here. Yeah, so we had that, and then we're getting multiple, you know, community requests on that particular feature. And so we are kind of evaluating the um, Loopback 3 version of uh, LB Soap and kind of combining that experience with um, LB4 Open API code generator and see uh, what the effort it takes to understand the Wistow XSD and the generate the corresponding models and the operations. So I don't think there's any technical challenge in that space. Uh, it's very much like uh, we need to have some delicate developer resources to make it happen. So, so far tentatively, we make that a high priority for Q3. Um, and then uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, definitely any contribution will be welcome. And if you want to be inspired, you can check out the open API command, uh, sort of like understand how we build up the, the basic structure of the uh, model definition, as well as the interface definition. Um, then we can use a similar capability to, um, you know, build up the uh, service interface for the whistle, as well as the model definition for the XSD schema. Uh, then we are good to go, but I fully agree with you. Uh, you know, the strongly type so web service access will be a, a great addition to the framework. Yeah, correct, exactly. Because um, I was asking that to 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 Bachstock because um, that is exactly what we are doing, right? Um, uh, in in the project I have been involved. Even if I like databases, I, I haven't been able to expose Lubac for to 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 really databases uh, in the majority of the cases, right? Only integrations, and the majority is the SOAP services. But we do it manually, for example. Uh, and then um, that's why I, I asked him uh, exactly what we are talking here by LB4 creation from Wizard files, right? Uh, if the, if it only for the remote interfaces, then it makes sense, so that whenever we are Connecting to a remote data source, we can we can say, okay, um, which of these methods would you like to to add to the to the endpoint from the Luba for perspective? Ah, okay, so then I just select the methods that the wizard exposed, right? 
is more or less that what we're looking for, right? Yeah, so I think there's uh, two different phases, right? One phase is uh, we are able to discover and um, inspect the uh, API specs from another system like uh, Wisto XSD or uh, gRPC spec or, you know, Swagger Open API. So that gives us the idea, like what operations and what data models are available, right? So um, then we can choose uh, the ones we would like to expose. So the CRI could be generate all the code to support that. Then one step further is uh, we can decide, oh, maybe some of the APIs we can directly expose them to the rest here. Um, then uh, we could um, make that happen as well. But in most cases, you might have to do a little bit of transformation or some aggregation. So we can go slowly from there. So to me, as long as we have the ability to uh, inspect the Wisto XSD and then generate the strongly type access uh, service proxies. Uh, that's a solid uh, starting point. Yeah. Great. Uh, just as a comment, right? Because probably we forget after the, uh, there is there is a package called StrongSoup. Uh, we we usually have the chance to open a PR on there, but we did a little fix locally, right, for us to work and. It's because this strong soup package sends uh, a TC, you know, hard coded TC uh, on the date whenever it's out. Uh, imagine that that was really hard to, to, to pick because whenever we send in the date to the remote uh, software web services, uh, they were actually converting the zone of the time, right, of the date. So whenever, for example, they say that we are we want an account summary uh, with a specific transactions, we send a range of dates. Then this little package has this TC uh, added. Uh, it, it needs to be removed uh, because otherwise, whatever we are sending is not really interpreted in the, in the sub service. Okay, that's good. So uh, I think you should uh, go ahead to create a PR against that package because we are maintaining that package by ourselves. It's owned by Strongloop. Okay, great. That's great. Yeah, that's just the question. Thank you for. You're welcome. And uh, to, to get started a roundtable yeah. discussion, I wanted to show you the changes which we were working on with Raymond for the past many months, and that was to enable TypeScript project references in pullback text on the repo. And I'll share my screen again. And so before these changes, and this was this is going back all the way to 2017 when we started the monorepo and the tooling wasn't very good for monorepos. We had this weird setup where each package was compiled independently. That's a must because for each package we need uh, its own dist file. So if I go to CD packages score, packages score, you can see we have uh, this folder there. And then similarly, we have this folder for every other package. So the build was working package by package. But when you open the entire monorepo in a Visual Studio code, we wanted to, to treat the entire monorepo as a single code base. So when you open, uh, I don't know, let's say in, inject, and if you want to uh, go to definition of binding address, we want it, oh, this is not a good example. Uh, to metadata accessor, that's a better example because it's coming from a different package. We wanted Visual Studio Code to understand that even so metadata accessor is loaded from node modules, those node, node modules are linking to a place in our monorepo and basically when you do uh, go to definition, you want to go to definition inside our repository. And now I'm surprised it doesn't work. Recently, I just uh, observed like VS Code sometimes it's very slow to understand the the packet references. Uh, maybe there's some internal building process uh, going on. That's possible. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so but that's the idea, and uh, the TypeScript team learned about this use case and how difficult it is to achieve it properly. So uh, what they did, they introduced the concept of project references, which allows packages to say. Uh, I'm referencing other projects. So, for example, our core package, uh, this is tsconfig in packages core, uh, is saying I'm referencing context and I'm referencing Tesla. And this 
uh, and this setup has many benefits. For example, it's speeding up our compilation because uh, before, whenever we compiled core, the TypeScript would have to go and parse context and all files in context. And then we would comp compile uh, to do example, and then compiler would have to go to context, parse all context source files, and then go, sorry, go to core, parse everything from core, and then go, go to context again and parse everything to, from context, and it was taking ages. So now we are able to build the entire monorepo as a kind of single build step. And under the hood, TypeScript will understand that uh, the monorepo project, which is this defined in the root TS config file. Yeah, to add on that, it's not only just for the top down build. Uh, so I just find a huge benefit of using this for testing. For example, if you have to create a PR that changes code in like three different modules, right, then now you can just go to the final module, say you want to test out with the to-do example that rely on some changes in the core or repository. So now you don't have to go to individual dependency modules anymore. You can just run uh, NPM build directly on the, the example uh, to-do. Then TypeScript is smart enough to traverse through the dependency tree and make sure all the build are up to date. So this is not only just, uh, you know, time saving, but it's also, um, you know, put proof uh, for you to make sure your, your code are being working together. Yep. So in, in the past, I was doing this workaround. For example, I was working on a to-do package. I would open a to-do controller maybe, and then I made some changes and I maybe wrote a test and the test was failing and I had to fix something in core. So what I, what I would do before would be multiple shell processes. I would type to the terminal, let's say C, okay, I would start in the monorepo root and I would say, C, go to packages core and packages core and do NPM run build. And if this is okay, or maybe even NPM test, depending on how much uh, how much confidence I want to have in the code I wrote. And if, if all is good, then go to see the packages uh, or examples to do, to do, and then we can do NPM test. NPM test will run the build first and then run the test. And basically what Raymond is saying that this is no longer needed. Okay, let's keep it simpler. So let's say I first build core and then I build to do. And the problem with this command line is that when I realize I need to make a fix in a repository, then I have to add another subshell to build the repository and it's a lot of work. So what Raymond is saying, you can skip all of this and you just do CD package examples to do, <clears throat> and do npm run build. And now TypeScript will check all the reference projects and projects referenced by reference projects to find out which files were changed and which files need to be recompiled. And then it will recompile also all files that are depending on recompiled files. So it works very, very nicely. So, Bachtos, this is not related to Lerner anymore, or is it still under the Lerner concept? Lerner type. Still on the Lerner concept, but Lerner itself doesn't deal with TypeScript. Lerner deals with how your NPM dependencies are installed, how do you figure out what needs to be released when you are making a new release, how a changelog is generated, so things like those. And what happens when you do npm install and how modules are linked. On TypeScript side, for a long time, TypeScript didn't understand monorepos at all. So we had some workarounds, but now it understands. And that's what I basically shown you here. So this is project references are enabling TypeScript to understand that your Git, your Git repository has multiple npm, sorry, multiple TypeScript projects to compile and they depend on each other and TypeScript understands all of it now. And there were some uh, shortcomings which prevented us from adopting project references earlier. I think project references were introduced in TypeScript version three, maybe a year ago, like 3.0. But the problem was that when you do, let's say uh, request body and you try to find all references, or maybe you wanted to rename it, then Visual Studio or actually the, the TypeScript language service behind the Visual Studio will not parse all files in, the, in your project. And if you look in, only into files that are part of, the, of your current project, so it would be only the examples to do TypeScript project, 
and in all files that are there ha that happen to be open in your editor. So in this case, it would be also in JTS. So as a result, the developer experience was not very good. And recently, the TypeScript team made some improvement improvements here. Uh, most notably, they are they're basically look at all files in the solution when they are looking for references. That's one, and two. Before they were using dts.map files to kind of go from the transpile output to the original source code, which meant that when you do a fresh checkout of a repository and open it in Visual Studio Code, uh, cross package navigation would not work. You would have to run npm build first so that all the different build artifacts are created, and only after that the navigation would work. And that has been fixed. Recently, basically, they stopped using it or looking at build artifacts, and now they are smart enough to figure out okay, if my uh, example uh, project is referencing core package and I see some TypeScript files in the core package, then I know that imports inside to do example are actually referencing those TypeScript files, and we do not need to rely on build artifacts anymore. So, long story short, it should all work very well now. Uh, I hope we will enjoy the better developer experience we have. There is one kind of missing piece, and that's ESLint, or more specifically, uh, TypeScript ESLint, package we use for linting. And this, this project or this parser needs to understand TypeScript projects as well and how they work together, but it doesn't understand project references. So at the moment, we have some workarounds in place, and as a result, running ESLint is very slow on the first run. And that's something I would like to look into myself. Uh, if you are interested in more details, the problem is in, uh, where are we? Is in this particular line, create default program. Uh, this is kind of a workaround to allow ESLint to check files which are not part of any project, any TypeScript project, but as a result, everything is super slow. So what I would like to look into is how to configure TypeScript in such a way that every file, including JavaScript files in our CLI package, are part of a project so that we can remove this, this override and uh, get faster ESLint, hopefully. And I think that would be the last change related to project references, at least for now. And then the next thing I would like to work on I'm not sure if this month or in Q3, it's integration with Kafka. That's a, like a, what I would like to get is to allow loopback developers to be accessible not only through REST API servers, but also through Kafka messages or events. And uh, as part of this effort, I'm thinking about uh, improving our documentation for extension developers, because if you look at creating servers, it's uh, has been created a long, long time ago, and it has only very minimal information about how to implement the server. So I would like to add more information so that uh, so that it's easier for other people to build integration with, with new transport, maybe gRPC or MQTT or I don't know, whatever, anything, or WebSocket, whatever they like. So that's kind of like a second goal I would like to work on as part of this uh, Kafka story. Yeah, so we have a couple of out in that area. So either a branch called pops up, kind of have some ideas to uh, connect the front end to the back end uh, for the messaging protocols. And recently, one of the community members, I think it's Dimitri, or uh, I forgot his name, he, he pinned me that he creates a, a Kafka extension for loopback. And that extension definitely just uh, uh, leveraging all the Kafka uh, capabilities uh, using the loopback dependency injection and the decoration patterns uh, to set up, um, you know, everything uh, that people will work with uh, Kafka APIs or Kafka conventions directly. So I think these two are complementary. Uh, so probably uh, I can give you some pointers for you start to work on these areas. Yeah, that would be great. So we have a, a GitHub issue. If you open the uh, Q3 roadmap pull request, Raymond, there is a link to a GitHub issue for Kafka. Mm -hmm. So if you could perhaps post a comment there with the pointers to what we already have. 
That would sure. be very helpful. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, that's one um, you know huge area uh, we would like to explore as well because I think we have a pretty good RPC uh, story today. But when it comes to messaging, it's a little bit ad hoc. Um, so if we can have uh, enhancement in that particular program and model area, that would be great. Yeah, and there's one thing I would like to mention also here. Uh, you are probably familiar with Open API, which is what we are using to describe our REST APIs. And there is a similar thing, which is called async API, AsyncAPI.com, which is a standard for describing event-driven architectures. So, I, so another area of my research is to look into async API and how we can leverage async API specification for implementing you know, consumers, I guess. And they say async API is inspired by open API. So I hope the concept will be similar enough that it will be easy for us to. Yeah, I try a little API. bit. There's some concepts we can borrow, but the spec itself uh, uh, still has more room for, for improvements. Um, so definitely use that as a reference, but probably don't tie it to that too much, especially at this point in time. And, and they are not overlap uh, at some point? Uh, overlapping with? In, in terms of the of, of certain um, specs that uh, might interfere with the open API, especially if it's... No, I think the position itself as a complementary spec to open API. So basically use the open API concepts to describe some of the messaging based uh, API patterns. For example, like uh, for messaging based, like usually people just use a weekly type message to going back and forth. So I think this back uh, allows you to use uh, JSON schema to describe the structure some of the some of the events, uh, and uh, define the concept such as a channel uh, instead of a path. Right? So for uh, RPC style, it's a path, and for this one, it's a different channel. So they try to chain all the different concepts together on the that particular spec. Yeah. All right. So it comes very handy in, in the in the in the sense of the Kafka integration definitely, right? Because it can be yeah. it's an event based. So I just want to make I just want to, to understand. So Bartos you are you are uh, you are saying for example that um, an extension Kafka extension that in inside loopback uh, to manage for example all these events um from the loopback to kafka and using a, a, a gprs for example as a method of web sockets directly to the ta kafka server no, 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 for sorry the... that's a mis mis misunderstanding so yeah, me... in a generic way a loopback can use different transport protocols to accept requests right yeah. now we support rest style over http yeah, I think uh, what, I, what I would like to support, sorry, I mean, I will just finish the sentence. What I would like to support is uh, accepting events through Kafka. And the other possible flavors are accepting gRPC con requests from accepting Kafka. WebSocket. No, 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 not from Kafka, from gRPC clients. Okay. Accepting uh, WebSocket clients from maybe from browsers. In the future, we might want to add HTTP3 quick base sync. So there are different ways how how let's say microservices can communicate together and i would like to uh, write documentation that will make it easier for extension developers to build new transports yeah i think the idea is to decouple the consumer side and the provider side right? so like as a client you could have uh, different ways to set events to the loopback server and of course the loopback server will have the ability to either subscribe to other brokers uh, to receive events or publish events to other uh, systems, right? So basically, uh, no matter if you use WebSocket coming to the system, then we will have the ability to relay uh, that kind of request probably to some controllers and that controller might, you know, uh, further publish events to, to Kafuka or consume uh, events from Kafuka as well. Uh, so we don't tie the front end to the back end, but loopback kind of serve as the 
uh, the, the gateway to enable a universal uh, program model that allows the events to come in and come out. All right. So we, we can be act like a bridge, like the glue to, to actually to all these components easily. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I understand. Once we have that infrastructure in place, definitely the different artifacts we have in the system could be a, a publisher or consumer of these events, say, like data source can subscribe to certain things, or they can produce all the database events into the system. And the controllers can do that as well. Like, for example, every time you make a call, maybe we can, you know, publish some, you know, uh, data to uh, the event stream, right? Uh, so that would be nice. Like we, we have all the different participants in the system be able to part of the messaging ecosystem. Great. Great. I think that it, it sounds very interesting for future, future projects also, because all this type of integration with, with, uh, with these messaging systems are, are really on, on the roadmap for many projects, I guess. Right. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It makes sense. Cool. Raymond would like to go next to share what yeah, I like sure. last month, what you worked on and what are your plans for the next month? Yeah, so I kind of have to split my time on the open source side and there's some internal project, but the good news is the internal project is still leveraging open source uh, loopback. So we kind of try to drive some of the loopback enhancement using some of the uh, work we are doing. So that's why you're seeing uh, myself kind of opening some of the PRs uh, to improve the framework because that's mostly driven by my internal integration work. Uh, which is very similar as uh, uh, Mario is doing, like, uh, you know, using Loopback as the API microservice framework to expose uh, new modern APIs, but the backend is kind of a mess. Like, you have to talk to databases, sub web services, you know, REST APIs from other cloud providers. Like, um, so that's very typical. So it's good validation. Uh, on the other hand, um, I try to push the boundary of the loopback for extensibility by doing some good examples. So that's why you, you are seeing me like adding some uh, C code to uh, jumpstart some of the efforts. For example, one of the PRs is to allow uh, configurations to be declared into uh, different formats, uh, just like many system not supports. YAML, JSON, JS, TS, whatever format, I then uh, use the configuration context APIs to uh, apply this configuration by loading these uh, different formats into the application context so that you don't have to uh, write code to call like, uh, you know, app.config this and app.config that. So that's a similar pattern we use for booting other uh, artifacts uh, we have in the system. So that's uh, some of the areas and uh, also, uh, you know, helping some of the community members to figure out what's the best pattern to create a uh, loopback for extension. So that's kind of aligned with uh, what Milsoft mentioned uh, at the beginning, because over the years, we learned uh, some good practice and the good patterns that will make the extension modules more uh, extensible and then more flexible and more configurable, right? So we need to burn these patterns back to the templates. So when people start with uh, a new pattern, they see the um, well uh, designed, uh, you know, structure and uh, some of the uh, ways to connect the pieces together. Right? For example, for every single component, you might want to expose a configuration injection and uh, uh, we might allow you to create your own declarations to wrap some of the flavors you want to expose to your uh, extension developers. Right? So once we have a few good raw models like that, I think our community can be really productive to contribute a lot of interesting uh, extensions, either to look back yourself or host their own, you know, packages. Uh, yeah, so we start to see that kind of trend to happen. So that's a Really great sign. Um, we are pretty excited about that. Thanks, Raymond. Maybe Mario would like to go next. 
Yeah, uh, right now we we are um, um, we are working on the on the on the health uh, programs that I mentioned to you before, and and it's called Dr. Henry. Right now we are uh, uh, deploying some ML models, uh, machine learning models, and uh, to Watson and just working also with with Watson service for chat system as the assistant and trying to inter integrate in right now uh, with with Lubac because as Raymond said uh, I still can't figure out you know uh, how, how to do it in an easy way um, without Lubac for uh, all this integration so we are integrating Watson ML um, and, and passing over all this information uh, to the to the health app Last week, uh, <clears throat> we had a call uh, to build rapidly um, a, a case, uh, it's called tracing app, um, case tracing map, or tra like a tr contact tracing application for this COVID-19. Uh, so we were supposed to, to implement, uh, to have it ready three weeks more or less. So we put aside a team that were coming from training from Luga 4 also. And and receive a, a little training from the John Hump, Johns Hopkins University. It's a five hours training that is free in, in Coursera right now. It's about how effective content tracing can be. And it's aligned with the Dr. Henry app, but it's really a different system. Um, and what it, what it does is that it, it doesn't really, for example, uh, use high tech in terms of the Bluetooth and all this contact information that you can have with interaction with the app with an app uh, <clears throat> because that's not effective. So according to the training, the, uh, the, the effectiveness is really uh, a specific, uh, like for example, eight, five minutes in contact to be a positive contact. You, are in a, in, you have been uh, positive, so you are now a case because you have the disease, for example. And, and starting in that point, uh, we are building something very interesting that will help the health department because for example, they need to not only start investigating what contacts did you do or were in contact with you, right? Positive contacts, but also they need to follow up, not only you, but also your contacts. And this follow up uh, consists, for example, on calls that they are very boring calls. Uh, according to the training, you know, uh, sometimes it's a 15 minutes long uh, call and people are at home, they don't feel good, they need to get some rest. And then, for example, that is where the, the Watson chat assistant comes in handy because we are pro programming it to be like a doctor, you know, to, to more or less uh, be in contact with you. Um, but then the app actually asks you on a daily basis, uh, how do you feel, your symptoms, etc. And then that goes to the back end. And, and so help, help uh, the people who is in charge of your follow-up can, can have more time to do more case investigation than trying to follow up on you, for example, if you are good, right, uh, at some point. So it's not really high tech in the terms of like many apps see it like, okay, look, this app, with this app, we we record your interactions with Bluetooth technology and, and all these things. It goes far, bar, uh, goes far away from that, right? Uh, it doesn't rely on the Bluetooth technology because you can have negative contacts. So it doesn't really manage your contacts per se. So it will help in the, it will help in the case investigation to map your contacts. And then the follow-up, which is more important than the, this interaction because the contact tracing agents have only probably two, two days in order to notify uh, your positive contacts to get in quarantine, for example. So more or less. So, I think that the sophistication part of it is is the the chat the assistant um, and that it understand that natural language to to actually give confidence and follow up with you and probably the ability to use further this data that is coming that in the how do you feel you know the, the symptoms so we keep monitoring of your progress that will eventually uh, help us probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, to train the model to 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 come with outcomes, for example, based upon this population, right? So we started the last week, and, and I think that uh, in two weeks we we need to to start some some uh, pilot testing and put it 
in the country. That that is basically. So it was kind of like uh, the work for the health app that we were working. Uh, now I I I I think that uh, I will dedicate some times uh, for this PR for the whistle because that is something that we really need to. We really consume a lot, and I think that is really. It, it would be good, right, to get involved in that. So I, I will learn how to process this whistle and and, and create that because because uh, because I have done a lot of this integration with Loopback and and I know, for example, that sometimes uh, the whistle is there. It comes in a chain, you know, and 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 the sub web service doesn't have the proper documentation. So it has been really painful at some point for, to grab it especially if you don't have documentation so it would be great to to have this uh wizard to to ask you the methods right exposed by the wizard at least and 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 to put it in this strong type so i will i will definitely work on it so i will open the pr so that you know that we are i'm working on that right and see how it goes Let, let's see I, I need to put my hands on this programming <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds great we are looking forward to see it that, that that is more or less that I am working right now. Thanks for sharing, uh, Dimitris. Are you still with us? Hey, you are on mute. Yes, I had some bandwidth problems, so I had to turn off my camera. <laughs> That's fine. No worries. Yeah. Would you like to share what you are working on and what would like to work on next? On loopback. Um, well, this is my first meeting, so you mean like how I got to know loopback or uh, how I'm contributing to the project? Oh, you can you can mention both. You can do both. Uh, okay. Um, so I, I work in the company, in an IoT company, which uh, works on the uh, ag sector, uh, post harvest food and monitoring post harvest products. So I got to know Lubak in 2016. Uh, I was uh, responsible, uh, I was a team lead for integrating uh, and using it in all our microservices as the main interface for REST communication. So we started with uh, Lubak 2, uh, 3. Uh, we are pretty happy with uh, how it went and it gave us a lot of functionality out of the box. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the chance due to uh, uh, limited time uh, in order to experiment to adopt Loopback uh, 4. Uh, another factor that stopped us is that we don't have a um, really big hands-on experience with TypeScript. And to be sincere, um, because I used the Loopback quite extensively, I, I can say that during the peak time, I was pretty comfortable with every source code line inside Juggler, uh, the actual packets, and it was easy to jump through line to line and see what's going on. Uh, however, using TypeScript, which uh, inserts an extra transpilation uh, layer, uh, it's a little bit more difficult for us for the concept to jump directly uh, having the same uh, produced results. So we need a little bit extra time on that. Uh, so basically, from uh, the project, from the repos, I have contributed mostly to the Juggler and uh, the MongoDB connector, which are actively using uh, in uh, my work. If you want to know anything else, I'm pretty happy to I will tell you. Yeah, this was great. And uh, do you have any plans or any areas you would like to, I don't know, work or improve or fix in the next weeks? Uh, um, to tell you the truth, I, I don't know if it's the right place to mention it right now. Um, we had some discussions with different people from, uh, you know, colleagues or stuff like that uh, about, let's say, the Node.js ecosystem in general. For example, it's, it's really nice for, for a person uh, to get uh, started, especially when you have new hires on your work and stuff. If you have a pretty uh, set road for them to follow. For example, in uh, let's say in other languages like Python, the, it's almost like the framework to go if somebody wants to build a, a REST service uh, Django, or uh, yep. at least the most commonly used. 
That would, that would be great if we could achieve this in the Node.js ecosystem because you see actually really numerous uh, frameworks to be used. Uh, but from my, from my side of view, uh, I, I don't know if there's any problem mentioning other frameworks. That's fine, go ahead. Well, there are plenty okay, of them. Think... are following them as well. There is Fastify, SJS, Express, Happy. Yes. I think that regarding uh, TypeScript implementation and integration, the top contenders are uh, Nest.js and uh, Lubac4. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I would like to point out, because we have actually we're going to pretty uh, like in the company what we're going to adapt, and there are other people's opinions as well. Uh, in order for uh, Lubac to be as successful as it can be, I, I believe that it needs to build on its uh, community. And one way to do this is, in my opinion, uh, to really put some hard work on uh, the documentation part. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I actually went through both uh, the pro uh, framework documentations, pretty much every single page, uh, at least a read through in Nest.js and Lubac. And what can I say is that, uh, for example, NestJet is really easy on the eyes as a documentation, and they actually do something that it's okay. It's a little bit uh, tricky that they kind of hide a lot of information, and it's not really explicit on how they achieve stuff. But this makes it really easy to read through. So it gives you the incentive to try it first. You're not overflowed with information, and then you reach you for surely reach a point that you don't know what to do, and then have to dig through. But it has already given you the incentive to do so, and I think that's something that we could look at too. And also, maybe look into other open source places where frameworks are compared, such as uh, the Real World .io. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's an open source uh, repo where people contribute uh, implementations of their project according to a specific set that must be followed, uh, pretty much a medium site clone. And a lot, of, a lot of traffic comes from there as well. Lubac could easily have a presence there in order to gain more traction. Um, Actually, I think that's that's uh, pretty much it. If it gives you like a straight point in the documentation on how to uh, have achieve certain results, for example, NetJS is really opinionated. You don't get like a generic way to do stuff. They tell you that you use pipes for transform validation. You use guards for authentication. It's really guided through. Um, uh, Lubac has a lot of uh, information as well, but it's spread in GitHub issues or uh, in Q&A sections, which are under pull requests. I think an also good option would be for them to be gathered in a Q&A section in the site or um, under the tutorials. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just my opinion as a guy who's trying to, you know, get into the whole thing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, all this. <clears throat> The kind of thing we all need to hear, especially for, from somebody who is new to Lubeck 4, because we have been like deep inside the framework for so long that sometimes it's difficult for us to feel what does it look like when you are new to the framework. And uh, would you mind to kind of uh, write this down into a GitHub issue so that we can follow up on it? There's, there was a lot of information oh, to shit. unpack. There was the ideas about SJS uh, and how they do, they approach the documentation differently. And that then you mentioned the real world uh, IO, was it? Real world dot IO, yes. So if you could include those pointers, please, in the, in the GitHub issue, that would be very helpful. If you agree with them and you find they're legit, I would be happy to open an issue, yes. Okay, cool. That would be, yeah, that would help us a lot. And we are already, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we want to make document improving documentation one of our focus goals for the next quarter. So the more yes. information we have about how to improve the documentation, the better we can plan the work. Definitely, that's that's one. What uh, Dimitri's comments were very important, I think, right? Because, um, however, for example, like uh, it really has to have a, a really balance. Because, for example, the product can be bad, the documentation can be very good, right? Sometimes I went uh, in, into certain uh, 
Google products, right? Uh, you fell in love with documentation, right? It's, it's amazing. I, I mean, for example, it's top notch, right? But whenever you put your hands on, on a real project, that's the problem, right? So, and, and I think, for example, like, um, you know, my perception, of, for example, um, I have been monitoring certain uh, not just, not just uh, groups in Spanish, in, uh, especially, especially um, I think, for example, like uh, the, the Luba 4 is a framework that is, is very uh, you, composable, uh, you can, it's composite. Um, very strong, right? Uh, it, it gives you the basis and also uh, provide you certain components to, to do certain jobs. But of course, its extensibility is probably some, sometimes misunderstood and, and, and its capabilities, right? It's like a Lego system. Um, you know, for example, like I did, I did a little test. I, I probably it, it, it could help in the future, as Dimitri say, right? Because it is really for new people. Um, I, I just gathered like uh, three persons, right? That they were coming from PHP Laravel. Uh, I didn't went into the loop before in uh, structure and, 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 and everything. I just went and say, hey, look, <clears throat> this is the angular part. And I create a really mock up uh, uh, screen. Right, specifically the material data table where you can uh, go next, go previous, and do the search. Very, very small. And who, for example, um, a generated uh, look back for endpoint that connects to my SQL database can interact with that. Very simple. I mean, imagine that, right? Data source, model, controller, and now that's it. It started. Now what, right? Uh, they don't like. Sometimes new people don't for, don't don't see, for example, the concept of, of, of the loop at four, uh, and and probably that is the the majority of the programmers that are in need of building uh, business applications, for example, and 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 that once it was generated, then I I presented the connection from an Angular application that connects to it. It was not until they saw, for example, the Angular application that was connecting to Look Before that they understood, for example, ah, oh, so this Look Before is really, instead of PHP, yes, you see, more or less, right? All the business logic goes there and this, this and that. I believe that adding to the Dimitri's comments, probably uh, we should have like, uh, because it's, I don't think that it's aligned with the sense or the essence of Look Before, right? But we should have um, uh, certain links, certain tutorials, uh, probably not part of the official documentation or yes, part of the official documentations where these programmers can actually have uh, like these tutorials rapidly, right? So that they can open their eyes immediately and see, oh, because the majority of the people are doing only that, right? Databases, databases, and they have React, they have Angular, uh, they have pure HTML, and it's not until they understand that. Uh, because they are still coming from the PHP world, right? But everything was really tied together at some point. Uh, it, it, for me, it, it should help. And, and Dimitri's point is really valid. But also, it's understandable that look before is more is more complex and simple at the same time, right? Can I also ask something else? Uh, uh, I think. It a really good point of uh, is uh, against other frameworks uh, is that it uh, already has integrated the ORM layer, which provides a generic querying system like the CRUD system from the database juggler. That's really helpful. And just because I mentioned NestJS earlier, they are missing this feature. For example, if you want to implement an API, there's an uh, a secondary package, I think, called uh, CRUD or something, let's say JS CRUD, which uh, they are uh, implementing a similar a similar pattern to Lubac with the operators. But unfortunately, the database support is not complete. And most importantly, they do not support uh, Mongo, which Lubac does. So that's a really, really a big plus. So you don't have to implement yourself for the querying system and, you know, parse the adapters like, uh, equal, not equal, including, etc. That's that's really great, and all the validation using the property types. Uh, so, what I wanted to ask is, 
What are the plans for Lupac 4 regarding uh, SEMA validation uh, of the data access layer and not only in TypeScript classes like we used to have in Lupac 3? If, if it is supported or if, if I haven't caught up with it. And because it is also mentioned that the, the juggler is actually mentioned as legacy. So are there any plans to move uh, on from it or we are continue to using it, modernizing it in uh, Lubac 4? Okay, so a bit of history. When we started to work on Lubac 4, we wanted to kind of rewrite everything from scratch, make it more modern, TypeScript, I think I went everywhere. And then we realized it would take us a decade maybe to do it. So at some point, and that's how we started with Juggler. We were like, okay, let's, let's do some legacy Juggler bridge. So just for the next few months so that we can start doing database queries using the existing Juggler. And then we will remove it in favor of something more modern before VA. But then we realized, hey, we don't have bandwidth to do that. So uh, Juggler is still part of Lubeck 4, and I think it will be part of Lubeck 4 for quite some time. And what we are, well, we don't have a concrete plans yet. From time to time, we start a discussion like how to approach, we call it Juggler, juggler Refactor, the task or the, the project. And so how to do it best. and. Uh, Based on the experience we had with Lubeck 4, when it took us quite a lo long time to get into a GA and then so many things changed that it was difficult to migrate. Uh, I'm personally pushing a lot for an incremental approach. So let's take pieces of Juggler that we can isolate or maybe rewrite into a more modern way, but keep the rest in place. And that's what we are doing with relations, for example. In Lubeck 3, all relations are in Juggler. They are kind of intertwined with the rest of the Juggler code. And in Lubeck 4, we started to approach relations from fresh. So we are not using relation code from Juggler, which on, on the one hand, it allowed us to build cleaner abstractions. So now we have repositories, we have uh, inclusion resolvers, which might work nicely with GraphQL in the future. And the design is easier to work with. On the other hand, it means in Juggler you have references, many has many through and all other relation types, which you don't have in Lubeck 4 yet, because we need to re-implement them in the new style first. Actually, relations, I think the relations have become a little bit more complex to implement in Lubeck 4 due to the fact that you have to integrate and implement different key components like the um, I don't remember how it's called, uh, where you have to inject the extra repository getter, like the uh, repository creator, then you have to also create a model interface that exports the actual model, including its relations. Yeah, it's a little bit more complex, but I think it goes with a package. Yeah, it's more complex, but then it also gives you more uh, flexibility. Also. Flexibility, yes, yes, that's true. I would suggest then if we're if uh, you're going to use a juggler for a amount an amount of time to go, uh, maybe remove the legacy uh, keyword because it seems like it's a little bit <laughs> not so stable. We're in legacy, still moving on. Confusing. <laughs> That's a good suggestion. I was thinking about it. Some, it always comes to my mind from time to time. Generally. Sorry. Go ahead, Yapa. I think we discussed about that leg that legacy word in Chile some time ago. Yeah, yeah, I think somebody has to open the pull request and make it happen. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, and so as for refactoring the rest, what I'm thinking about is uh, again taking an incremental approach. So, what we also heard from uh, other people trying to write a connector, it's kind of lame that you still have to use ES5 syntax and callbacks. So what I would like to do is allow connectors to be written, written in async await style. It is already possible to use a ECMAScript 6 class keyboard, so that's good, but we should also allow connectors to be written as async functions. And this can be done in a backwards compatible way. So basically Juggler can check if the connector is callback based or promise based, and depending on that, it can invoke the method that way or another way. And this would allow us to uh, gradually start rewriting connectors from callbacks to async await. And, and, this, and once 
this rewrite is done, we can also implement a new layer in Lubeck 4, which will not use Chuggler at all, but it will create its own data sources and then call connectors methods directly bypassing the data access object class from Chuggler. And I guess uh, Raymond introduced uh, recently the type ORM uh, proof of concept or yes. something, right? So yes, you can, yes. that, that's the composite, composable. Yes. And somebody else is working on type goose and mongoose integration. That might be more of your interest, Mitris, if you are using uh, MongoDB. So the idea is, okay, and on one hand, it's it's great that we have the same querying syntax for all different databases in Lubeck. But on the other hand, if you want to do something more specific, let's say use a binary JSON field in PostgreSQL, then it's difficult for us to support all those different special things in every database. So maybe it's better for you if you are an advanced MongoDB user to use Mongoose, because Mongoose is all about MongoDB. It understands MongoDB, all the special syntaxes it has and all features. And if you make it easier to integrate Mongoose with the rest of Lubeck ecosystem, so maybe we can create a repository class backed by Mongoose or maybe inject your Mongoose models into controllers. I'm not sure about the details. Then maybe we don't have to spend so much time on our ORM because basically everybody will be able to use the ORM they already like or prefer, be it type that's, ORM. For that's, exactly, that's exactly what I was thinking for, but also provide this option and clearly displayed in the documentation. And yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree at your approach with your approach about incremental changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe it would be great for people to be to feel uh, to feel it like more more easy to engage to look back for. It's uh, the part with look back three at the first level, and then we can use it anyway. So let's improve it. For example decide about things that are on hold on issues like what is going to happen with operation hooks or uh, the download of uh, the downloading of files using uh, streams and not the complete buffer things like that um, so that, that's that's for it to, that's for um, me and uh, also some other people to have uh, the the total uh, image that it's good to go so it's not something that it's I will use it and I will have to change it uh, like in the next release and always keep uh, keep uh, up to date with the release notes. That's that's a little bit uh, discouraging in order to implement integrate your application with a new framework. Yeah, that makes sense. That's all for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for uh, listening to all my comments. Yeah, you're so welcome. Good, very very good feedback, Dimitris. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can you go next? All right. Okay. So it's like a continuation of uh, a section of what Dimitris was saying. I've, I've been working on uh, the docs, uh, particularly focusing on the request response cycle in Lubeck 4 and uh, comparing it with uh, Lubeck 3. And also, I have uh, documented the differences in the, the, uh, the booting process of Lubeck 3 and 4. And then uh, currently, uh, I'm working on uh, the ability to create uh, controllers, mo uh, uh, repositories, and models after the application has started dynamically. So I think this would be a good feature to have if uh, uh, if someone would like to expose that can be discovered only after the application has started because our models are hard-coded files. So I think this is a very good feature. Okay. Thanks, Yapa. So Yapa, we already have some support for the controller start and stop, you know, uh, after the application has already been started. Uh, so we have the context view uh, plumbing that allows you to watch the command go of certain bindings and to do some, you know, clean up or refresh on top of that. So uh, when you look at some of the use cases, uh, you know, just uh, ping us and uh, see if some of them has already been covered. Yeah, 
so my personal opinion is uh, we have quite a bit of infrastructure that's uh, powerful enough to do a lot of different things. Uh, so adding new extensions, new experiences, uh, it's a uh, very, uh, you know, smooth uh, per se at this point. So we just have to create a more uh, models uh, for people to follow. More examples to showcase the ability to uh, extend the framework while not sacrificing the piece of uh, you know supporting module you are integrating. Okay? Just uh, glue them together, but not invasively change uh, how it works. So we could have a good balance between the common abstraction we have in the framework, for example, talking about the Juggalo case, right? So we could well support 80% of the use cases that people want to have a universal way to do crawl across different databases. But the rest of 20%, uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, constrain developers uh, um, from not uh, being able to do that uh, without using a third party a more focused OIM, say type OIM is good at handling SQL uh, relational databases, right? With uh, join and some other advanced capabilities. Then Mongoose is good at exploring the Mongo specific operations. Um, and similarly, talking about PopSup support, like uh, uh, in the generic PopSup, we could have many different kinds of brokers, MQTT, Kafuka, uh, you know, and some other things, but if you really want to dive into the advanced features of Kafka, then probably the Kafka extension makes more sense. So I think that could be a good balance we uh, always keep in mind. Like we do some common extractions for the uh, common use cases, but we also offer the ability to have more uh, native or specific extensions that enrich the user experience with uh, loopback uh, plumbing, such as the dependency injection, uh, the ability to glue uh, the different pieces together, the ability to uh, extend uh, things to be uh, discovered, for example, like say, uh, for, for a cron job, right? So the library gives you all the API to add cron jobs. So uh, if we want to bring that to loopback, then what we could do is uh, define some extension points to allow people to contribute uh, jobs. Then the framework will use Loopback to discover all these jobs and run the jobs on behalf of the Loopback developers. Right? And similarly, when you, uh, most of the third party library would have uh, options to configure the things. Right? Then if we use the Loopback way of uh, configuration, then we have that flexibility to decode decouple the, the who's making the configuration and who's consuming the configuration. Okay. So I think that's kind of the, the connecting points uh, we should promote more for loopback to embrace, uh, you know, third party um, like uh, frameworks or, or uh, libraries. And of course, some other uh, means like the, the declaration based approach, um, it's a good shortcut to supply metadata um yeah so uh once we have uh, a couple of examples like that then we should be able to really enrich the uh smooth out the the developing trends for people to be more productive good and i'd like to hear, fr hear from agnes and jenny as well they haven't really had a chance to speak agnes can you go first please Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I currently um working on the Hetman theme emulation. So that was originally from my community maintainer, and uh, it's kind of like stopped. So I'm trying to help to and uh, land the um, the PR like gradually. Yeah. So that's what I'm currently working on. Yes, I think Jenny can go next. Agnes. Yeah, I can go next. Uh, so uh, recently, um, we um, we will have some uh, internal workshop and uh, tech talk 
um, regarding Lubex 4, um, the tech talk is about the authentication and the workshop is uh, for uh, <clears throat> for beginners to uh, get familiar with Lubex. So recently I'm preparing for those, uh, um, for those presentations and also um, um, a, uh, a code contribution recently I'm working on is uh, how to uh, run the LB3 uh, tests in LB4 app. So the spec uh, was done by our uh, intern, uh, Nora, and I, uh, I continued her work. And, yeah, uh, and in the near future, I think my uh, focus will still be the authentication area. So we have some uh, improvements and some code clean up to do, and <clears throat> especially for the uh, documentations, uh, we see many uh, users um, create suggestions and feedback for the authentication and authorization docs. So uh, my next uh, focus will be cleaning, <clears throat> clean, help cleaning up those uh, documentations and also um, see after um, uh, uh, Ribbon uh, merged the uh, support feature how uh, we can make the authentication uh, action more flexible to to add to be added to the app yep that's um yeah thank you okay thank you jenny and agnes for sharing that with us and we are already more than 15 minutes past the time it is was scheduled for so i think i'll call it the end all for joining and see you in four weeks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.